Well, welcome to this podcast series with a bit of a twist because I am exploring um, people in the field that uh, have dabbled in storytelling. Uh, on this episode, I have the amazing Laurie Silverman, who I first came across probably about 15 years ago when I saw her speak at, we think it was the National Storytelling Festival, and I purchased her book, When the Data is Over, which was published in 2006, which literally coincided with my journey into storytelling, and she was... Um, is, is one of the pioneers of storytelling and storytelling in business and um, how we communicate more effectively in organisations. So welcome, Laurie. Thank you so much for the invitation to join you today. Yeah, it's good to catch up again after so many years. So tell me a little bit about, I, I know we were talking before and you said you don't consider yourself a storytelling expert. In fact, you call yourself a shift strategist which i'm intrigued about and i'd love to know more about and you were the founder and ceo of partners for progress which is um i guess a company that you've now been running for what must be over 20 years or yeah almost 30 years oh really almost 30 years. years well there you go there you go so this is what i mean the, the pioneer of you are the pioneer of stuff so tell me a little bit about um i guess how you started with a bit of a lens of how you sort of came across storytelling and started to talk about storytelling? Um, you know, it was um, a series of serendipitous situations. I had joined the National Speakers Association and at my very first conference, the opening keynote on a Saturday night was a woman by the name of Jeannie Robertson who mesmerized me. I, I was spellbound in the audience. And what I realized afterward was that what she did was tell story after story after story, but they all had amazing key points associated with them. Now she's also a, a comedic speaker. So her stories had these wonderful uh, twists to them and were oftentimes about her husband. Coupled on the heels of that, I was asked to keynote I was in the field of total quality management at the time, and I had had a book come out called Critical Shift, and I had been asked to keynote to 1,100 people about the future of the quality movement across the world. And because of that keynote, I decided, so this takes us back a long ways, to throw out every um, overhead that I had, if you remember overhead projectors. Oh, yeah, it was, it was <laughs> and I, I would oftentimes have hundreds of these for, a, for an hour talk, I threw them all out. I had, remember having these eight huge garbage bags sitting at the curb for someone to take away. And I created this keynote. And then I went to the city where I was about to give it and stayed with a colleague and his wife. And he asked me to go through my talk the night before. And when I did, he said to me, I know you throw out the overheads except you didn't replace them with anything. You needed to replace them with examples or stories. So we stayed up all night and, and he helped me craft some that I actually told the next day. That still didn't kind of, the bell didn't go on in the head yet in terms of what I needed to do until two women approached me about helping them to write a book proposal. They wanted to write a book of stories for trainers. Wow. And I had had a very difficult time with the book Critical Shift, I had actually lost a couple publishers along the way because one didn't want to put anything about spirituality in the workplace or social responsibility in the book. Um, and, a, and a second one didn't like the results of the research that we did around the world. So they said, help us so that we can be very successful in getting this book published. And they sent it to a very small professional association. But the contract came back from a very large publisher. Uh -huh. And when that happened, the primary author said, I don't wanna work with a big publisher. She left the project, which left the second author with a contract she had to fulfill. And she called me up and she said, I don't know what to do. And I said, I'm an author who's always in search of a great book to write. And since I helped you to write the proposal, how about I become the second author? I said, only if we do this book together, it's going to look nothing like the proposal. That's too small. I want to do something that's really grand. And that's what we did. Um, and that eventually became, oh my gosh, I think Stories Trainers Tell as a book is probably close to 500 pages long, has almost 100 stories in it for people to use with permission and has all the training modules associated with them. Wow, that's a great resource. What, what's that one called? 
stories trainers tell. Ah, excellent. I love, um, I love your story about, you know, seeing, seeing the person being inspired by the stories they share. I often in my training workshops go, you know, we, we go to conferences after conferences after conferences and we see speakers and we sort of think they're really like, they're amazing speakers. But when you look at why they're amazing, it's because they're all sharing stories. And, and the real key is, you know, share a story with a many, a message, a story with a message, a story with a message, and people remember the stories and therefore rem remember the messages. And um, it, it's, it's great that your first book was on training because I think the really good teachers, the really good trainers understand the power of storytelling as a way to, um, you know, communicate your message in, in how it gets through. So, so after you wrote that, then you started to write um, When the Data is Over, which I love that book. I, I, I still remember the, um, I actually lost, I, I think I read it so many times, I lost the the paper sleeve of it so I've just got the, <laughs> the bare white hard book but I still remember the, the front sleeve was a, a it was a picture of a guy almost like falling you know that oh would fall on his desk with all this data like ah oh, you know well actually how that book came about um is really interesting when uh, stories trainers Kel came out I decided to launch my own media campaign. And so I started to get radio and TV shows through a PR company that I had hired. And every single host asked me the exact same question. Now this takes us back to 2003. Mm -hmm. And they all said to me, can story be used for more than training? Can it be used in sales? Can it be used to pitch a proposal? Can it be used for other sorts of applications? And at that time, only Steve Denning's book, and I think maybe Annette Simmons had yeah. something out at the time, and there were a couple of other resources, but no one had taken a look at research around the world about the use of stories. So what I decided to do is I went to the company who had published, uh, Wiley, who had published Stories Trainers Tell, and went back to the acquisitions art, um, uh, person and I said, here's what's been going on. What I'd like to do is I'd like to, <laughs> I told them I said it would take me one year to do an action research study to look at five examples of the use of story. And I did not say storytelling, but the use of story in every business function. Yep. Three years later, 2006, the book Wake Me Up When the Data Is Over actually came out. And what was, I think, really profound for me in that book, because I learned as we wrote the book, which everyone else did too, who contributed, we had over 200 people that were interviewed, 16 contributors, there were lots of individuals who had touched different touch points for it, was that we really didn't understand story beyond storytelling. Mm. That we didn't recognize that there were a variety of other techniques that people were creating that were very useful. The other thing that we didn't know, and this is not even in the book, it's actually in an article I wrote afterward, is the ROI associated with story. I actually stepped back, I think it was a couple months after the book was written and I had an association come to me and they said, could you go across all of your 80 examples in the book? I think there were like 81 of them. And could you tell us what the aggregate is telling all of us about the return on investment? Yeah. You know, does it really help employee engagement? Does it really help from a financial perspective and so on? And yeah. we were able to show, we were the first research, action research study to show that across all different disciplines, story could have application. Yeah, it, it's a question that I'm, I'm still asked now. I, I think fundamentally people still get how storytelling is powerful because they, they can experience it themselves. Right. Um, but you still get the, the numbers, people that go, well, well, show me the return on investment. Um, you know, why would we do this? And I, I um, so it's, it's great you did that study all those years ago. Um, it, it's funny. I, I, I often think, God, is, has anyone shown the return on investment by death by PowerPoint? I wonder if we've got any. <laughs> but we continue to use that. We continue to use death by PowerPoint and we're not, you know, but um, some people you introduce the concept of story and they go, no, 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 we'll just stick to our facts and stuff. Well, I, I think it's not, um, Kendall Haven's book, you know, the 2007 book, Story Proof, where he looked across hundreds and hundreds of research studies just about the value of story to the human brain and why it's more memorable and things. To me, it's something that I hearken back to with people. But we now, what we didn't have at that time that we now have is, we didn't have brain research. 
You know, yeah. we didn't have Paul Zach's research. Oh, we didn't have Damasio's yeah. research. The research is amazing, yeah. Right, we didn't have Kahneman, System 1 and System 2. And all of those apply to story because, you know, PowerPoint is informational. Yeah. But if you're really trying to shift, and this is the work I do, how do we shift people's thinking? How do we shift their behavior? And then how do we shift results? We have to move them to action which means the only form of narrative that works in that fashion is a story. And, and then that brings us to, you know, this whole question of what's a story, right? Um, yeah. but, but that's, I think, part of our challenge is we're still in this belief system that information is where it's at because a lot of people don't know the brain research that's come out over the last 15 yeah. years. I reference, um, in my latest book, I reference Zach and, and Damasio's work a lot because it's just... It's just, um, it's research that's showing us that, you know, with what story does, it taps into emotion and the, and the whole role that plays on the brain. Right. But, but our default in business still seems to be to try to um, shift people. So try to influence, still to drive cultural change, to try to shift people to do something different by information. And um, in the vast majority of cases, information just informs people. It doesn't actually shift them as... Um, I often say if it did, none of us would smoke because it's information, <laughs> but we still do. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's been interesting, um, you know, that you, you've identified the work or the power, I guess, of how you could apply story across all disciplines. So not, you know, obviously training and teaching people, um, but, you know, in sales, in leadership, all these other areas. How have you seen um, the shift, you know, because when, when you started, and certainly when I started, storytelling wasn't a thing in business. People really weren't talking about it. They were still, I mean, people would seriously laugh at me when I told them I was teaching people how to share stories better in business to communicate. Where have you seen the shift over the last, you know, 15 years as storytelling now is becoming like really popular? Um, well, I, you know, I, I'm obviously limited by the work that I do. So there, there are two shifts that I personally see. One is in this whole uh, body of work around what I'm going to call uh, different types of future story. Yeah. Right. So, uh, and, and I've delineated four different types. I'm certain that there's more types than that. You know, I talk about um, if you're doing scenario work, you've got scenario stories. Um, if you're a leader in an organization who's trying to bring forth something, you have your own personal dream story, which people really can't argue with. I and mean, we all have our own dream stories. But then along with that, we have what I would call co-created vision stories. You know, it's one thing for each of us, if we're sitting in a team, to have our own dream about what that future might look like out there. But then how do we collectively come together to co-create a single vision story that we will align behind? Mm -hmm. uh, that will drive our behavior. And then there's a story that comes before all of those, which is kind of that, um, why do we need to change, transform our yeah. organization, which is one that we forget to tell. It's the story of pain and urgency, but it's still a story that's going to spark us in terms of where we go in the future versus staying in the status quo or, or to stagnate, you know, which a lot of organizations do, right? You know, there's no such thing as homeostasis. <laughs> if you're not making any changes, you're going backwards. Mm -hmm. Do you find those why we need to change stories end up being quite factual? I, I find when companies do attempt to that, it's, it's very, you know, it's very factual as we're losing market share, the, you know, technology's changing, we need to change. And it. Well, I wouldn't say that those are stories. Those are just descriptions, no. yeah. right? descriptions or explanations. Um, one of the things that uh, I don't even know when this was, maybe about the 2005 well, no, it was 2007, 2008 this happened. I was speaking to a group of corporate folks who were leading communications initiatives in their organizations. And I was talking to them about business storytelling. And someone in the audience said, I just had a realization. I said, what's that? She said, the way we in communications define story and the way you in business storytelling define it are two completely different definitions. And I remember going back to Karen Dietz, you know, who is, uh, to me is one of the true pioneers in the field of business storytelling. And I said to her, Karen, has anyone written a document where they show a well-constructed, compelling story in other forms of narrative? Like show it as an anecdote, show it as an example, or a description, or a case study, or a vignette, or a testimonial, or a profile, you know, 
And we actually crafted that document. And the next year I went back to the exact same conference and I said, I took your feedback to heart. And here is, if I were to craft these, how it would be different. And I think that when people see the examples in front of them, there's this kind of like, oh, oh. And then I say to people, what form of narrative do you normally tell? And most people say a description or an example. Yeah. You know, an anecdote. And that really starts to open up the conversation. So um, you were asking about like, where did I see the field going? That's one, this whole area of a future story. And to your point, the, the, if we just describe what the facts tell us, that's probably not going to be enough. But that, but that leads me to my second kind of um, what I see in the, in the future. And that is this whole area of data. <laughs> yeah. And um, this uh, people trying to, I'm going to use the word storify data, which has its yeah. own, is its own misnomer, so to speak, because you can't really storify data. You can create stories around the insights that emerge from data. Um, and then you can use those to communicate to other people and help them to digest what the key nugget is in the story. But um, what's happening right now in that particular field is we have tech companies uh, misinforming people that a data visualization is a story. And, and that has two problems to it. I mean, you have a tech background, so you probably see this as well. First of all, just because we have observations from sets of data, those aren't insights. So they're, the, the data visualizations are still data. Yep. They're still they're just observations of the data. They're just a different way of visualizing it, right? It's a picture instead of you know showing a table of numbers. And the second thing is because of where the technology is today, um, data visualization is easy for companies to put out there and to sell. And they're telling people that if you link a series of them together, that that's a story. Yeah. All and, right. and I think, right, they're kind of, they're trying, yeah. they don't know that the field of digital story even exists, but they don't know what a story is. And so there's um, a lot of educating that we need to do. Yeah. And um, Laurie, it's amazing you say that. I had literally, this was about three weeks ago, I did, um, a one hour presentation on storytelling to a whole heap of um, tech companies who in product and, you know, they, I guess my, I think my definition of story had helped them realize what they were being told was story. So a woman at the end said, I've been told by um, my boss that I need to turn these five data points into a story. And that, and she's going, that's all he told me. And I've got no idea how to do that. And I said, you can't do that. I go, his definition of story is not correct. You can't just link five bits of data and make it a story. And then I talked to her about it. I go, there, there could be some of those data points that you can bring to life by using a story to demonstrate it. But just, just whacking five points of data is into a logical sequence does not make it a story. And I think that's what people think. They think as long as it's a logical sequence, um, th they think that's a story and it's, and it's not. <laughs> Well, let me give you um, a, an example of a leader who actually did something good. Um, so I want you to imagine a, a new head of finance coming into an organization and a woman who's heading up a reporting group. And this new leader says to her, when she gives him at the end of the month, the PowerPoint slide deck of the, <laughs> of the data for the month, he says to her, this is nice. However, I'm wondering next month, if you could give me more white space, just like have less information in it, you know, just kind of give me the highlights. So the next month she gives him a slide deck that has more white space in it. And he says to her, thank you, this is really good. And it's going in the right direction. Now what I'm wondering is if you could do the following with your group. Before you give this to me, could you put one piece of paper on front? And I would like that one piece of paper to tell me the golden nugget, mm. that one aha, that wow sort of thing that only you and your staff know because you're so embedded in the data. That one thing, not only do we need to know, but we might need to action. And she said to me, I said to myself, what the heck is a golden nugget? <laughs> she said, but my staff and I worked really hard on this. And the next month, we actually came back with something that we felt everyone needed to know and it needed to be front and center on this front page and that really sparked new and different conversations and he was really trying to get at what is the insight 
yeah. that's in here. And then she said to me, but you know, some months there are no, there are no golden nuggets. And I said, that's exactly correct. Mm. That's what people don't recognize is that they're, first we have to identify these insights or golden nuggets, but there are a variety of types of insights. And sometimes in a set of data, all it's doing is it's just reinforcing what we already know, which then tells us maybe we're not collecting the right data, which is a whole separate sort of conversation. But that example that she gave me of how he helped her and her team to start to get a realization of what they needed to report on and what the most important piece was, I think uh, will stay with me forever. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's a really great thing. I often have um, uh, people talk about uh, case studies and I go, it, the vast majority of case studies are not stories. They're right. really valuable information that you, you still need to know. Um, but often say, you know, maybe the front page, and I often say this, maybe the front page of the case study is a story that actually yeah. just one, you know, one little insight, one example of something where I read that and go, wow, that's really interesting or that gets me hooked into it. And then I can read the case study if I want to, but, but I could potentially not read the case study and with that one great insight could still pass on some, some information. I mean, clearly not all the information. So yeah, I think it's, um, yeah, it's, it's just a valuable way to look at it to say, you know, with all this data, what is one insight? What's the one golden nugget? And I, I would suggest that maybe the golden nugget is always the story behind something. <laughs> well, we want, to, we want to create the story around the golden nugget to make it more easily digestible to people yeah. because there's two ways we could present it, right? I could give you a golden nugget and just tell it to you. Here's yeah. what I learned. Or I could create a story that moves you to action. Yeah. And so I think that's where one of the intersections between story and data. There are multiple intersections. This is just one. But that's why I use the word storify. How do I storify the insight versus yep. just stating it to you? Because it, I say to people, why, why are you looking for it? If you're just looking for it because it's a nice to have, don't bother. If you're looking for it because you have a decision to be made, or a problem to be solved, or there's an opportunity that you're trying to see if you can find in this myriad of, of, of stuff, then you're saying that you want to move people to action. We only know story to do that. Yeah. So yeah. it's, you know, so I've, I've been devoting the last couple of years to what does that process look like? How do you go from raw data through this entire process? Um, where does story fit in at each piece? Where does intuition fit in at each piece? Because there's a lot of misconceptions as well around um, the that the human brain has the ability to process only objective information. And you and I know that that's not the case because we, we know that emotion is needed to make any decision. Absolutely. Um, so, and all, right. that re all that research shows that, you know, first of all, we process emotion faster than logic. And, and it's, it's what, it, what drives us to action and what forces right. us to make decisions. Uh, you know, I mean, obviously we're speaking to the diverted you and I, but I, again, I often say that some, sometimes you just need to inform people and so just give them the data. You know, if they just need a project status update or whatever, just the data. But if you're trying to influence them, if you're trying to get them to do something different, um, drive them to action, then, then you need a story to go with that data. Um, and so I like the way that you say how you storify it and how you make it easily digestible, which is, um, which is what a story is, which is, you know, why it's such a powerful communication tool. Um, I, I want to spend a bit of time, we're talking, we started to talk about the definition of stories that everyone's sort of saying, you know, let's put five data points together and it's a story and then this is a story and the, the narrative and what I'm finding. And in fact, I'm, at, I'm sort of, I actually get a little bit angry about this. Someone put something on LinkedIn the other day and said, um, it's like stories being hijacked. We're, we're, we're taking st stories gone too far and um, everyone's now just doing story and, uh, and we're sort of getting over story. And I'm going, oh, look, we are so, I think we are so far from too many stories. We are still stuck in too many bullet points. Um, but I think what's causing that is what you and I just touched on then, this definition of story that people are calling, people are calling, they, they're just, because story is popular, they're calling anything a story. They've they got, you know, this is our you know, st strategy document. And they go, it's our story. It's not, it's not your story, it's your strategy document. So what are your thoughts on that? That the hijacking, I think, what I see is the hijacking of the word story which means we could story, the power of story can start to be diminished, I think. 
we started to see this, I would say, um, a number of years ago already, where people saw that the, the field of business storytelling was gaining in prominence. So everybody and his brother jumped on the bandwagon. Yeah. Yeah. And they, like you said, they started calling everything they saw a story. And, it's, and, and that is diluting the narrative itself. Um, and, it's, and, and it's causing problems. My, I have a, a couple of experiences that reinforce this. One was when Wake Me Up came out in 2006, I decided that I wanted to get together all the thought leaders at that time in the field because I had a bias. And my bias was that in any industry you work in, there are standards. Um, it, it, it could be standards for lighting. It could be standards for the battery that goes into your car, the tires on your vehicle, um, the size of clothes and, you know, how they're um, cut. We have that for everything except for the field of business storytelling. And what I couldn't find was, and it didn't come out of our research as well, was a standardized definition. So I gathered all these thought leaders in a conference call one day, and I shared with them what I observed, and I asked if we could create one, and the answer was no, they weren't interested in creating one. And I said, well, that's going to put us on pause. You're going to hit the pause button on this field, because the only way to make improvements is if we have a standard definition by which everyone tries to achieve, and then we can raise the bar from there. I think we are still there. I think we got stuck. That's just my observation. And, and because we didn't come up with a standardized definition, what's now happening is now all the tech companies are coming in and saying, oh, you know, data visualization is a story or my, uh, my hub, my analytical hub is a story because it puts all the data together into one place. And so the term is, as you say, being hijacked, but I think it's being misinterpreted. And we have a... And, it, and we have an obligation to come back and really fight this battle. Because if we don't, we're going, our field will not continue to gain the level of credibility and prominence that it really needs to have. And leaders are going to say to us, why do I need to learn what a story is? Like, I work with CEOs um, here in the U.S., a, a small and medium-sized CEOs, teaching them about story. And... Most of them, when I do interviews up front, don't know what one is. They do what you say. You go and look at their websites, and everything that is put up there is a story, including yeah. testimonials from their uh, clients. And, and when you come back and you say, but it has, there's a science behind this and an art. And the definition is a combination of the two. They, they stop in their foots and, uh, foot tracks, and they go, I'm afraid I don't know that. Yeah. And so then can you teach me? But you know, in these other fields, people are moving ahead at a million miles an hour and they're not stopping to say, what does this defin definition, what is this definition? And I, I think you and I, in the work that we do and other people in the field do, I think we've got to, at some point in time, my encouragement would be that someone corral us all again um, and, and say, can we come up with a common definition? You know, and in, in, uh, I, think, I think you just sent me a challenge, Laurie. I think yes, I did send you a challenge because people. I see you yeah. as this person. I mean, yes. Karen Adits and I did in business uh, storytelling for dummies. When we wrote that in 2013, we, I told her, I said, I want to, I want to draw a line in the sand. I, I really do. I said, I, I, we have to come up with our own standardized definition that we use in this book. And we're going to distinguish it between other types of narrative. And if the rest of the world doesn't want to acknowledge that, that's fine. Except the entire book that we do is going to be consistent. Yeah. So that no matter what piece you pick up to read, no matter what chapter you look at, like you might start with the chapter at the end on story and sales. You might start with the chapter at the end on um, story use and organizational change. But I want you to know that the way we've defined story in that chapter is the same as what we did in chapter two or, or one. Um, and, and, and we've taken that theme through. Yeah, I, I think it's... I think it's a real issue um, that we need to face. And that's why I think I'll take up this challenge because you do, everyone, you know, every field has their definition of story. Like, mar you know, marketing, we'll talk about the brand narrative. And as you said, now the, the digital, all the agile people, they're coming in and they're talking about story, you know, in where I look at it and go, that that is not a story. Why are you calling that a story? And it gets to the decision makers in the company, like the CEOs that are going, I'm, I'm just so sick of hearing the word story and everyone, you know, has a different meaning to it. And I don't even know what it means and it's confusion. So when you genuinely talk about how do we use stories to, you know, drive change and get 
buy-in and all that type of stuff, um, they're dismissing it because it's 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 made it so confusing. So um, I think you're right. I think I think Aristotle tried to two and a half thousand years ago when he said a story needs a beginning, middle, and end. But there's a lot of things that you know a piece of rope has a beginning, middle, and end. It does not make it a story. So um, yeah, we we perhaps need to do some work on that. Well, and I would um, just uh, uh, also set up another challenge along with it to define story by its structure. Yeah. Is one a smaller definition of story yeah. than I'm talking about. Yeah, exactly. I'm talking about what what is a definition of story that also encompasses its use. Yeah. And its purposeful reason for being, and that and also takes into account the art the art piece of this because art and science is not separate so when you see a lot of people they'll say well my definition of a story is it's the story arc and it's got these seven components and you know here's the script for it and oh by the way if you fill in these seven blanks and these seven lines you'll have a story created that's we're sort not like, that. it's sort of like painting by numbers isn't it yes, yeah. it is. that's an excellent yeah. way to think about it and i think we need to talk to them about the blended piece. You know, what is this blended definition? And why, and why does story exist? I mean, for Karen and I, we talk about it as, you know, there there, there have to be these um, packets of sensory information. And I kind of, I, I sometimes make it akin to food. You know, when you take in food, you're taking it in to fuel your body, right? Mm -hmm. Stories, when you're taking it in, are to fuel your mind, your heart, your spirit, and your actions, right? So it has to be, the, and, and our brain lo loves sensory information. So those are the packets, just like food, that makes it more easily digestible. And then we have to structure it in such a way that people can internalize it, comprehend it, and get meaning. Not just make sense, but move to meaning making. And that's another issue because a lot of people don't distinguish between sense making and meaning making. Yeah. Especially in the field of data, those are wildly different. And that's what the data industry has given to us. Is they're really allowing us to make this distinction far more specific than we have been able to up until this point in time. And, that, and that's where my conversation is. With people. <laughs> we have a lot of work to do. Yeah, yeah, excellent. We do. Um, is there anything else you'd like to have a chat about in regards to storytelling? I think we've had a good talk here about all things story. Mm -hmm. I think we have. I, um, I, I think that what we touched on earlier, I would encourage also to be brought out more. And that's this whole piece around what is the brain research telling us? Yeah. Um, and, and especially, and I, I don't know if you're, are you familiar with the work that Deborah Small has done? Um, no, with her not. colleagues? Oh, so, so um, let me um, take you through a bit of a scenario and have you... Yeah. Um, so I want you to imagine, I always tell people, I use kind of myself as an example. When I went to college, um, I was always in need of spending money because I would run out. And so the easiest way to get spending money on a university campus where I went to school was you could sign up for psychology experiments. And they would pay you in cash at the end. <laughs> so maybe the experiment was 30 minutes and you'd walk out with 10 US dollars, but you know, hey, you could go have lunch or whatever. So I want you to imagine that um, a bunch of us have been brought together and uh, the experiment itself that Deborah or her colleagues are running isn't important, but it's what they give us at the end that's really key. Because remember, we've come for the money. And each of us is given an envelope. Only there are three different types of envelopes. So some people in the room are given an envelope, and inside the envelope is a letter about a little girl in an underdeveloped nation who has no clothes, no or food, or housing, or education. And in it, our five US $1 bills, and would we please donate? That's yeah. group one. Group two is given an envelope, and their letter is different. Their letter is about all the good that the nonprofit does who supports children, millions of children like this around the world, and the results that they have been getting through all of their work. And again, we have five US $1 bills, and would we please donate? The third group gets another different letter. Their letter is a combination letter. It's a combination of letter two with all the statistics and letter one with the story. And would you please donate? So then I say to people, which group do you think gave the most money? Now, when I do this in a large group setting, people are split. They will either choose group one that has the story or they will choose group three 
the story and the, and the statistics combined. And I tell people, hands down, unequivocally, strip one gave the most amount of money. And then I ask a second question. And I say, of groups two and group three, which group do you think gave the second most amount of money? And almost every person chooses group three. And I say to them, I use my hands, and you and I are on a podcast, so it's hard to visualize this, I'll describe it. I'll hold my hands high up over my head, and I'll say, this is the amount of money that group one gave. And then I'll take my hands, and I'll put them down to my waist. And I'll say, this is the amount of money that group two gave. And I'll say to people, now watch my hands. My hands are still at my waist. Tell me if my hands move. And I'll say, this is the amount of money group three made, but I never move my hands from my waist. Right. Because... As soon as you start to add numeric data to a story, you shut down the ability of the unconscious emotional brain to actually go about making decisions. You turn to rational, which means you're going to get a debate about the data, or you're just going to get silence about it, but you're not going to get action. That study has been repeated over and over and over again at multiple universities. It's in the fundraising research. We don't bring it into the business research. Mm -hmm. And, and to me, that's the, just the tip of the iceberg because we need to share with people just because you have a story doesn't mean you can also add data. Yeah. It's, um, <laughs> because yeah. of how the brain works. I, um, I wasn't aware of uh, Deborah Small, but I've certainly come across either that research or similar research. And yeah, the, one of the biggest mistakes I, people, I see people make is they think the data and the story are important, which I say, yes, they are, but they combine them and yeah. you know, no, they keep them separate. Don't start bringing, the moment you bring facts and figures and statistics into your story, it, it's exactly what you said. It, it shuts down the emotional connection and it just makes your story ineffective. So it's almost like tell the story as a separate thing and then have that data somewhere else to back it up, but don't, that's one of the biggest mistakes I see people make and they, they start to combine it and um, it just doesn't work. Right, but it goes back to what you shared earlier. It's, it's the brain research that people yeah. don't, they, they, they just don't know and we don't share it widely. Yeah. So unless you're doing, you know, unless you're someone, so I work as an academic, as an adjunct professor, and so in my classes, we're always referencing research at the master's level. Unless you're doing that, right, you're not gonna be out there looking for it. So I think that's another obligation we have is to start bringing forward more of that research and making it accessible to people and talking about it in light of narrative. Mm. I did. Um, I actually wrote a white paper a couple of years ago on the science of storytelling. I think I need to dust it out and share it more widely and, uh, and hope people get to it because it is there, there's a science behind this and I often talk about it. in fact a lot of my um, presentations I do on storytelling is called the art and science because I think there's a science but there's you know there's certainly an art like painting it, it isn't just color by numbers it's sort of you know you've got to bring your personality into it you've got to be aware of the audience you've sort of got to play with things a little bit but it's certainly an art and science to it well absolutely well and also I think you know um, and Paul Zach's uh, research around um, compassion fatigue is so critical here as well, because he, you know, he's shown us that your your stories have to have a single main character. You can't have a group as a main character, no. um, which is problematic sometimes. But the other piece that people don't talk about is what I call point of reference, for lack of a better term. So the example I'll give is my, my friend Dave, in fact, I'm going to meet him tomorrow for breakfast. A couple years ago, he was in a biking accident. So going down a road with cars and was hit broadside, a uh, bike was totaled, he was sent to the hospital. Who's, from whose perspective do you tell the story? Do you mm. tell the story from his perspective with his key point? Do you tell the story from the perspective of the driver of the vehicle and her key point? tell the story from the perspective of the person who called for an emergency vehicle? Do you tell the perspective from the story of the police officer who showed up? Do you tell the story from the perspective of someone just walking down the street who observed it? Every story is valid, but what we don't spend enough time on is this nuance around, if we're going to move people to action, whose perspective yeah. and, and the situation will actually move the audience we're talking to, to action. And, 
and I've seen, been involved in situations where I've coached people because the perspective they took on a story didn't get them, for example, funding that they needed for a, gov from a, from a, for a government project. But when they went back the next year and told the same story, but from someone else's perspective, they got funded. Yeah. Same story. And I think it's that little tiny piece of this that we know this, right? You and I are practitioners in our, in our fields of choice of using business storytelling. People who are out there just talking about story and, and all other forms may not know those nuanced mm. things related to how we craft. And that's what makes the work that we're doing, I think, so valuable. Yeah, that's what makes it an art and science too. Right? Yes, exactly. It's yes, really exactly. different ways we can do this. Um, Laurie, this has been amazing. Thank you for being part of it. And, and I know you're on holiday, so thank you for allowing me to interrupt your holidays. Um, can I ask you two personal questions that I love to ask every person I interview? Oh, um, sure. Okay, this one's really hard, this one. <laughs> What's your most favourite 80s artist, song, song or artist? Song or artist? Yeah, song or artist, you can go either way, from the 80s. Actually, it's hard for me because most of mine are favorites uh, who are out now. I probably would say Madonna. Um, uh, oh, okay. And, it, and the reason I choose Madonna is because she was groundbreaking oh, in her work. Yeah. Everything she did, like um, it opened doors to so many possibilities. And I, and I did see her recently because I live in Las Vegas. I have the opportunity to see artists, you know, every day of the week if I want. Um, yeah. And, and the trail, the doors that she opened for so many individuals, men and women, in terms of the art form of music, is amazing. I thought you would. I thought you might have gone George Michael because every time I used to think of your um, "Wake Me Up When the Dart Is Over," I used to think of <laughs> the Wham, the George Michael song, the you know, "Wake Me Up" <laughs> before you go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> And, and the other one is, um, and I'm putting you on the spot here because I haven't even given you these questions, is um, what advice would you give to your 20-year-old self? Oh. Uh, I, I know exactly what I would say. Um, most of life is set up for people in terms of their career choices to set goals and achieve them. And what I now know at age 61 is that our purpose for being or our reason for being on this planet, that calling, that destiny is what we need to find. And it is not found through setting goals. It, it is found through paying attention to that inner voice and all the messages that come to us from people around us. None of the books that I have written in my lifetime were because I set out to write a book. Yeah. They all came because I paid attention in the present moment to what people were saying to me or to what was going on around me. And, and today I, I can say that I, I now know why I am on this planet. I now know the work I am meant to do. If someone would have said to me 20 years ago or even to my 20 year old self, this is what you're gonna be doing at age 61, I'd have gone, I have no idea what that work is that you're describing. <laughs> Um, but, I, but I'm very clear, I'm very clear that it is not as m so much about choosing something, although, it, and I had a conversation about this recently on LinkedIn that I posted for people, and people have different perspectives from around the world. You know, some people just see careers as a job and the money that they bring in to support other things. I really believe that the sweet spot is when our passion meets our calling, or meets our destiny. And we have the skill set to do it or the ability, the perseverance to go learn how to do that and to do it well. Because I think that what all of those combined together make for something unique and different and beautiful. But I, I certainly, I, when I was 20 years old, I was still trying to be a plastic surgeon. You know? <laughs> You know, I, I still was geared into getting my undergraduate degree in molecular biology. And I think that's uh, where I am today. I, I was, a, when I was 20 year old, I was a mainframe computer operator. I don't, I don't even think mainframe computers even exist these days. <laughs> I don't think so either. <laughs> um, you, 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 just, you just gave me a big a heart moment then when you talked about the book writing, because every time I write a book, 
I um, and, I, and I'm just amazed. I actually failed um, English in my final year. So I'm amazed as much as my school, school friends that I've written five books. But whenever I write a book, someone always says, when's your next one? Or are you going to write a next one? And my answer is no. I like, no, I don't. But knowing, but then I always do because it's not that I'm, not that I'm going, oh, I need to write a book in the next two years. Something happens to me that I think I should write about this. So, um, that, yeah, I think you just gave me clarity around why I always say, no, I'm not going to write a book, but always end up writing something that just comes to me at some point. Well, it's, uh, again, for me, it's a, for, I have other people who've come to me and said, I think you should write a book on, you know, this particular topic. Or like I said, you know, the, the, the media interviews that sparked wake me up when the data is over. What, what I was the conduit for was hearing those comments and then taking them forward. And I think that's what we are. We're this vessel. Mm. That we're, we're, we're hearing a need that people have. Nothing out there is fulfilling it. And yet we know that we have the skills and we have the voice and the talent to put it into words. And that's where I think my gift is. My gift is in synthesis anyway. So I do a lot of action research because that's how new ideas come to be. And so three of my books are like that. Yeah. And I made, to your point, I mean, someone asked me recently, Will, you know, how come you haven't written another book since 2013? And I'm like, you, I'm like, it's not, now I say it, the time's not right. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, <laughs> something may happen to change yeah. that. It, not that may soon, or it may never be in this lifetime. Who knows? Excellent. All right. Um, hey, Laurie, thank you so much. I'll, I'll, at the end of this, I'll put on all the stuff where people can find you and, and, and read all your books. I'm sure there's those books needs to be uh, dusted. I think I need to go read them again. It's been a few years since I've read them and I'm, I'm really interested in reading that uh, the one around teachers because I think that would be that would be valuable for a lot of people in the corporate space doing that. So thank you for your time. Um, I look forward to not making, making sure that the next time we speak is not in another 15 years. So um, thank you for your time and all your insights on storytelling. And on a personal note, Thank you for um, being the Madonna of uh, my industry and blazing the way because it was only through the likes of you and Annette Simmons and Steve Denning that I, I think gave me um, the confidence to say, you know, there's something in this, there's something in this. And, uh, and I think I had a calling for that, that I, that I could go and do something and, and help leaders learn this valuable, valuable um, skill and art form. So thank you very much. You're welcome. It's been a delight to catch up with you.